um, I, I was also recently approached by a pharmaceutical company with equal offer. Um, so <laughs> it's nice, I mean. We spend half our life kind of like applying for grants, and this still happened to just come to my door. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to try and share with you today a little bit of the work we've done. I wanted to extend the presentation and thank uh, Robert Lehman, who's here. He's the one that he was my former student. Um, he's the one that started working with me on this. Um, then he left us to go to NIH <laughs> and CBI. So I'm graduating. I don't know. They, all my PhD students end up doing the same thing. They want to graduate and leave me. <laughs> so <laughs> anyhow, um, this work has been ongoing for the last uh, three and a half years. It's funded by the NIH, the NLM. Um, and uh, we have learned a lot of things along the way. So I'm going to try to summarize these three and a half years of work uh, for you uh, with the special focus on this linking idea. So keep it in the back of your mind. I'm not going to refer to it too much until we get to the end. Um, because, well, if you go to the online forums and Twitter and everything else, everybody knows at this point now that it is a very rich source of health-related information. People share the most private things on Twitter that they won't even tell their doctor. So I, one, one, one story, we, I was analyzing data myself for, um, uh, we wanted to see drug-drug interactions. Anyway, I was looking at this blog, and, oh no, at this uh, series of tweets from one, uh, one single user and way at the beginning, she said, oh, I opened this account so my family doesn't find out what I'm going to write here on Twitter. So I almost felt like, like calling her or something. <laughs> Anyhow, so uh, there were very private things shared on that particular um, stream. 26% of Internet users actively discuss their health information. Out of that, 30% admitted to changing their behavior based on information that they got online. Uh, mind you, they're not very selective on the sources many times. 42% um, discuss current medical conditions openly on um, either um, health-related um, sites like Daily Strength or others, patients like me. Not a favorite of mine, but anyway. Um, I'll tell you, I can tell you why, baby. Maybe, if I get time. Um, we have focus on two specific sites, all our work. Uh, Twitter and Daily Strength. Uh, Twitter as a sample of microblogging, where we don't have the burden of having to come up with a game to get people to let us into their messages, private messages. Um, Twitter is just public by nature, and that's what we use. So Facebook, on the other hand, is very close in the sense that only public posts are available, and not a lot of people post publicly on Facebook. Most people have the default of friends on Facebook. So, if we were to get these percentages, apply them to the number of tweets out there, so the 26% and the 30% and so on, uh, of people that change behavior, um, there were 645 million users as of January of last year. Uh, this year is just it grows and grows and grows, so it's no use updating it too much. So, with that, if we could estimate about 50 million will change their behavior over time based on information that they find there. Um, so if there is 9,100 9, tweets per second, about 1,000 1, tweets per second about current medical conditions. So this gives us an idea about the huge amount of data that's out there um, in social media. Now, um, we have focused our work on adverse drug reactions. There is many angles to this that could be attacked. Yeah, I just haven't gotten to it. Drug-drug interactions, effectiveness, um, abandoning treatment or following treatments, and so on and so forth. So there's many angles. Um, Post-effectiveness, uh, a bunch of other things. We have focus on adverse drug reactions, which is the unintended harmful response suspected to be caused by the drug taken under normal circumstances. So no overdose or any of the other things. Um, what's the impact of ADRs in the United States at least? Um, over 770,000 people injured or die, by, by injured I mean gravely affected, um, 
each year in hospitals from adverse drug events. Uh, many of the schools have been preventable. Um, different consequences. ADR, sometimes we think of, I don't know, nausea or things like that. They can be much more um, uh, uh, severe than that. So allergic reactions, yes, sort of a mild one, bad dreams, so on, things like that. Um, death is my extreme adverse reaction, and it's there for many medications. Um, my husband refused to take a medication that was recommended by his doctor because it had death listed there as a possible adverse effect. <laughs> so I don't blame him, but, but it, it's there. The possibility is there. Um, what we want is improved reporting mechanisms recommended um, across the board openly to reduce the incidence of, this, of these events. So um, why go to social media? Why go directly to patient reports? Um, many times, and actually this is one of the biggest hurdles we had at the beginning, that people just didn't trust the data, didn't trust people who have anything new to say on social media about adverse drug reactions. Um, there is, this is, this is an old study, 1996, of course this was not in social media, it wasn't around that much at that time. This was done, um, it's a study done uh, based on reports by patients <laughs> via telephone, I believe. This is one of the original sources we always use to motivate this. Um, so, based on these reports, they compare to see when the reports of this very adverse effect was um, uh, happening, and they found that up to six to nine months ahead of the established mechanisms, um, it was already being reported by, um, by um, users of the medication. So, so that's, one, that's one of the potential um, um, benefits of using patient reports. Um, also, in um, all of the established efforts that are out there to get uh, people to report these adverse effects, uh, it is estimated that only 10% of the occurrences are actually reported through these uh, websites. One of the reasons is pretty hard to find. Um, MedWatch, uh, there is, it has, it's an open form, but once you get there, they ask for everything, like your whole life history is there. So many patients are just discouraged, I and mean, after a few fields, you just quit the thing. Um, and I bet everybody has had that experience with the surveys they send you online and all that. If it's more than three questions, you're out. Uh, so, so that's exactly what happens here. Uh, whereas, like, venting on Twitter is pretty fast, it's like um, very, very fast. So that's the question. ADR reports from Twitter really is like, are you gonna, how are you going to use this? Who's going to trust this? Well, we found that 35 to 40 percent of the postings for treatments in health-related forums, um, like Daily Strength, include potential ADR mentions. So they are very rich. Um, they are, thank you, they are um, dense in health-related forums. Um, in contrast, Twitter only gave us about 0.5 percent of everything we collected had um, an ADR. And by everything we collected, I mean we, key, we, uh, we did a uh, search by keyword with the drug name as a keyword. So even when they mentioned a drug or a medication, um, only 0.5% had a potential idea. But the beauty of Twitter is 650 million users and more. So it accumulates quickly. Okay, so I'll give you an idea about the numbers that we have um, now. So the challenges, though, is... Twitter has much less context than these health forums. In health forums, you usually find the whole history of the effect there to the glorious details. So, um, so it, is it is more information. Um, Twitter has less context, less structure. Uh, misspellings and query limits on the site's APIs also present a problem when doing um, large volume monitoring. So here's how they look like, some of them. Uh, just to give you a taste of it, of the style. So, um, this one, ha, not if you're on cerebral, extremely vivid dreams that stay in conscious memory, very freaky, <clears throat> any idea why? But this was, of course, directed to someone. Um, we didn't get the whole conversation, but that's that. Um, I think Backhofen might, might make me a bigger <laughs> uh, AS than usual. 
or I don't know how to abbreviate that without saying it in a public <laughs> presentation. Anyhow, <laughs> um, so we tagged it very beautifully uh, here, personality change. Now, I always say when I see these original tweets and I compare them to the very lame things that we tag it with, um, I think we're missing half, the, half of the story here. But anyway, we have to do it. Um, personality change is what we tagged it with. This one, Baclofen greatly exacerbates the AD part of me, ADHD. Average length of, length of focus today, about 30 seconds. Now, focus was tagged, celebration impaired is, um, is the annotation for it. It requires a little bit of extra knowledge because 30 seconds, you have to know that's short in order to, to really tag it like that. So there's, a, there's just a few of the challenges. The, the, the language is very florid, very vivid. Um, some things present extremely difficult things to map, even if, I mean, you get the concept. Who barely wake up this morning, and I feel like my body's made of lead. Um, what to tag it with? What to normalize it to? Uh, so drowsiness, maybe, but it might not reflect the same thing, okay? So that, those are some of the, of the challenges. Um, still, we forged ahead. So what did we do? Tweet collection and pre-processing. We have keyword-based collection from Twitter's API. Um, I don't know how familiar you are all uh, with, um, with Twitter collecting and so on. In 10 seconds, or 20 seconds, I guess. Um, there's several ways that you can query Twitter, where most, uh, you, most users are familiar with the searching on the Twitter interface. Um, you put a keyword and it gives you the top tweets and some other different categories. Um, in that, you're not limited in the sense that it shows you everything. If you have a specific keyword, you might get a, a, a lot of tweets. If it is very, very uh, refined, you'll get less tweets and so on, but it's all over time, over the whole history of Twitter. Um, it, you cannot really use that for obtaining things and data like we do. You have to go to the programmer's interface and follow the rules on, in regard to mining it. I sadly learned that now they limit even the tweets by with the user handle. It used to be if I had your user handle, I could go uh, check it and get everything you have ever tweeted about. Now they limit it to 3,200 tweets. Why that number? I don't know. It came out on a bag or something. They just came up with 3,200 tweets. Um, some people say that's a lot. Well, uh, we tried it, and uh, we, were, we located someone that we were interested in on the user interface with a tweet from November 2014. Try getting the user handle on the API to get all the tweets. It just got us back to April of 2015. So in six months, she tweeted 3,200 times. <laughs> I don't know. Unemployed, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, um, so Twitter's API then lets us do this. They have limits on the number of queries that you can send and so on. So we generated for each of the drugs, we have several variants because people do not spell things right on Twitter. Much as have we tried of telling them to spell things correctly, most people don't. And so we have particularly drug names, okay? So Seroquel, which I cannot even pronounce. Seroquel, 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 whatever, whichever way it is pronounced normally. There's many different ways that it can be written, okay? Um, I think the closest correct pronunciation is Seroquel, but um, anyhow. So we did this, um, we generated variants, but not just with the edit distance, because that's not very reliable in this case. Here what happens is um, the doctor tells you that you're going to get syrup on someone, you hear it, and your brain processes it. And all of a sudden you have this picture of how you're going to write it. Okay? So that's what's likely to, be, to show up on Twitter, is this variant um, uh, of, um, of the original name. Um, so we generated using pho phonetic uh, spelling. We generate the phonemes, map back to the potential characters that could be uh, used for that, and form um, variants of the thing, of the original name. So we have that. 
So for each drug, we have many variants and we collect. We did some pre we do some pre-processing, remove tweets with URLs, which are usually advertisements. We uh, remove retweets. And then for analysis, we usually balance the corpus um, with respect to tweets per drug, so we don't end up annotating all of the tweets for one single drug. So there's a paper published on that um, at AMIA Summit of 2014. You can look it up via that um, last name. That's uh, the student uh, who may now for this work uh, for the variants. Then what do we do? Okay, so next we do, the next doesn't work. Manual annotation of some of it, of a portion of it. All of this is available, by the way. So if you were tuning out, I'll tell you, all of this is useful. You can get it, you can use it, you can play with it. Um, so everything that I'm going to mention, there's some form of it available online, okay? So we annotated ad for other drug reactions. Um, we did a span, start and end position of the mention. We have also annotated for the UMLS concept ID. Um, the trick here is, we use UMLS concept IDs, but we form sort of a special consolidated lexicon. I'll tell you why in a second. Um, for the particular corpus, which is our largest one that we share, is 10,822 tweets. Um, we, had, we had it annotated by two experienced annotators um, and expert oversight. So we have a pharmacologist oversee the, the, um, the annotation. How many minutes am I going to have in the end? 30, 15, 20? Uh, oh, nice. You're generous. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so we have my, so I can relax. Manual <laughs> annotation of this corpus. Um, we had two students with biomedical background, PhD students, annotating, plus the, the expert oversight for um, disagreement resolution. Um, they had fun. Many of our annotation guidelines do not cover all the possible things that people say in this place. Um, we augmented our original lexicon, that uh, Lehman paper in 2010, that was published at the BioNLP workshop. Um, it just happened to be the first one of its kind. So it is the first paper you can find on extracting ADRs from social media. Um, there was nothing published before that. So we had a vocabulary that we used there. And um, it's towards Internet Age Pharmacovigilance is the title of it. Um, and uh, we added more things. So the lexicon that we have now available at that link that you have there, um, it has signs and symptoms not procedures from the UMLS. And um, what we did, though, is we consolidated, OK? Uh, UMLS, if, again, if you're not too familiar with it, has many, many, many concepts. Many of them are very ambiguous. So they have shades of meaning that are important when you're um, tagging in literature, but it's impossible to do in social media, OK? so. When someone says, had me all woozy, that's what you have. You don't have any other information. So you're not going to know if it's dizzy, nauseous, uh, I don't know, unbalanced, or whatever else, all the other possible related concepts <clears throat> in the UMLS. You just have that. So what we did is consolidated so many of the terms that had enough of similarity. So we use similarity measures. Um, of every concept against every other concept in the UMLS. Took a while, a long while, but we had it. So we condensed them down to 7,483 out of the 16,182 in the origin. Um, so we have that. It all, it, it, we made sure it includes concepts from CIDR. Um, also a subset of this one, the CHP, the Consumer Health Vocabulary, which is uh, online, you can look it up. That one um, sought to be a little bit closer to colloquial terms for medical terms. Still, it doesn't have puke in it. Okay. They probably haven't added it. I have said it so many times this year that maybe somebody from CHP heard me and added it to it. But last time I checked, they didn't have that. So still, I mean, it brings us closer. Um, I was thinking of publishing, a, I don't know, social media health vocabulary. 
which is even a lower denominator than the consumer health vocabulary. Uh, but we added those terms. We added co-start. Um, you can download that compiled vocabulary um, lexicon from um, our website. Now, I assume the slides are going to be made available to you guys. As <laughs> the links are long. I have not done the tiny URL thing. Um, the way we have organized our website so that you can navigate through it is that we have, for each of our papers, we have a, um, a home page. So sometimes it is better to go to the home page of the thing. Ah, let some work here. I know, but PDFs have links. Anyway, you type that, that's better. Um, because what can happen is, doesn't even let me copy. So sad. Okay, anyway, if you click there in your own computers now that you're there, uh, you can see is the abstract of the paper that corresponds to that particular um, concept. In this case, that's the one for concept extraction. And it has uh, downloadable resources on the right. So you have links to the vocabularies, to the collections, text, everything, samples, everything's there. So you can use it and work with it. Um, the corpus metrics, Cohen's kappa of 0.69, which means substantial agreement between annotators and I quote <laughs> exactly what it means. Um, it's, it's pretty hard, though, because as I said, we'll see, like the other example I gave you, different annotators can think differently of what it means. Okay? Um, we always had fun with the hangover one, where we had to consult with more knowledgeable students <laughs> to see what a hangover felt like. <laughs> so, um, so, if, if, so if a medication gives them a hangover, it's like, what in the world does that mean? Um, so we have to check. Here are the counts, the official counts. Uh, we had for the daily strength training set at Tesset. Now, don't get excited because that one we cannot make available. Daily strength has very strict restrictions as to how we share the data. So they basically don't let us share the data unless we're collaborating for a research project. That means my name goes with that data in the paper. <laughs> in order to have it, basically. Um, I said that to one famous lab in California, and they didn't take it. So <laughs> anyhow, um, so the, just for that, the Twitter data you can use just by referring to my paper without me having to tag along. Um, Twitter training set. We have uh, 1,300 user posts, so more or less, with uh, 2,434 sentences, um, 28,000 tokens, 845. Uh, ADR mentions. Um, we haven't mentioned that we have two kinds of things. We have indications and um, ADRs. Um, where did I put that? Next slide, I think. Um, so here's an example of what I mean. Um, this this uh, Twitter post on A has an indication. So schizophrenia in that case was tagged as indication Whereas tremors is an ADR, and weight gain is also an ADR. So we distinguish the two when we annotate. Um, it's important, of course, for distinguishing what are the adverse reactions versus what the drug is being used for. Um, so same thing, stomach hurt, heartburn, horrid taste in my mouth. Um, but it cleared up the infection, so indication is, uh, is that annotation. So we, we actually had four categories at the beginning. Um, ADRs, beneficial effect, indication, and other. Um, we haven't kept up with all of them, particularly beneficial effect. But we do have uh, consistently annotated indications. Um, there's some other over here. Because, for example, diabetes is there, but that's not what this person is taking this medication for. Okay? And it's not a side effect. And there's some, <laughs> which is drowsiness, but... Um, uh, it's a side effect. So, but we have other there. Like it's there, but it's none of the things that we care about in this particular case. Um, uh, so anyway, so we have all that. So the tasks that we address, or what we set out to address at the beginning, is classification, concept extraction, and normalization. An easy central point to access the resources, all the corpora. So if, if you care to play with all this data, 
Uh, we have a shared task that uh, ran this year. We have all the results in and everything. There's a workshop scheduled to be done at the Pacific Symposium of Biocomputing in January. Um, it's the first time PSB is running a shared task. So um, it, it's novel in that sense. Uh, PSB usually is just for uh, present, presenting full papers and so on. We set it up as a workshop and we had actually more participants than we expected. We were aiming at having at least five teams from around the world to do one or another of the tasks. Uh, we set it up exactly like this, classification, concept extraction, and normalization, and provided training data for all of those. Uh, we ended up with eight participants in the classification task, two participants in the concept extraction task, and nobody in the normalization task. Um, so we wanted really to have a team that will beat our systems, really, <laughs> because we wanted to see what else we were missing. Um, so uh, results are out and everything, so you can go check them out. Um, it just shows you the level of difficulty of each of these tasks, okay? It's not easy. Um, normalization, we will present the normalization by then, um, but for now, nobody is really working on it. Um, for classification, our latest publication on classification is a journal of biomedical informatics paper uh, where we show what we did with portable automatic text classification for adverse drug reaction detection with multi-corpus training. Um, basically, um, it uses on a large set of features representing semantic properties, sentiment, polarity, topic, uh, from many of the short text nuggets from different sources. We combine training data from other corpus, including uh, some clinical records and some literature, actually, with the social media. And we ended up ending uh, with uh, better classification accuracies to our own prior work. There is also a related um, uh, survey paper. Related, I mean, we stopped in 2014 and looked at everything that had been published in our paper in 2010. It was pretty funny to see the trend of citations because at the beginning we had like two citations in the whole year in 2011. And then it started growing. So we had two, and then four, six, and then 15, and then 30, or something like that. So a lot of people working on ADR extraction now um, and classification. We made a survey paper that you can also find in St. Authors and somewhere uh, on JBI. So that gives us a better idea. Give, we'll give you, we reviewed, I think, 74 papers in that survey of methods and everything else they did. So that's for classification. For concept extraction, we also have a publication, or latest is in the Journal of the American Medical Informatics. Um, it's pharmacovigilance from social media. So mining other drug reactions using sequence labeling with word embedding cluster features. It's a deep learning technique. Um, in our later work, uh, latest work, we have been focusing a lot, on, a lot of unsupervised methods. I know there's a lot of talk here about annotating. Completely valuable, invaluable, I guess, but very difficult to obtain, as you know. So we have been leaning towards um, developing a lot of the unsupervised methods. So that's an example um, of how we did it. Okay, so it's a CRF conditional random field method, a variety of features including this novel feature for modeling words with semantic similarities. It's the latest that we have. Uh, it did work better than anything else we had published before. And again, it's all available. It's actually a working uh, model of ADR mind that you can play with if you want. Um, downloadable and usable. Uh, some of the challenges for extractions, as we said, I mean, not, they don't always use terms in medical lexicons. You cannot find it with lexicons. A lexicon-based approach is going to have serious limitations. Um, semantic type classification has proven to be a very, very difficult problem. Most uh, We try and try and try, but ADRs versus indications are always uh, difficult to distinguish. It's like... Um, well, in this case, anxiety symptoms is an indication. Sometimes it appears as an ADR. So for all uh, purposes, the, the machine uh, learning 
approach is working, it just doesn't have enough to go on. So we've been working on it. We haven't, I mean, we never give up on a problem, so we're still working on that. Um, the, the informal postings, the misspellings, the unusual misspellings, because say, okay, try speller, uh, uh, correct, uh, uh, spell correction software. Those are not, until recently, trained on the kinds of misspellings on social media. Misspellings on social media are many times on purpose and have meaning, okay? So when you repeat the same letter many, many times, it's not a misspelling, technically, right? You're trying to emphasize something. When you, you do things with uppercase, when you do things like that, it means something. So we've debated a lot about this misspelling correction because to me, we're stealing meaning, we're shaving meaning away from the posting that could be useful later. But for now, okay, so we're doing it. Quick, big, huge table on the comparative results of extraction, SBM, lexicon-based. If you look at that line, with my little, little light. Um, if you look at that line, lexicon-based, which is where most people have spent their efforts, okay, including us at the beginning, uh, is way low, okay? 0.577, with an F score of 64, um, or best performing ADR mine with the clusters uh, of semantically related words uh, reaches 0.82%. Um, on Twitter is uh, quite significantly lower, 0.72. This is on health related forums. Um, but remember, we don't have as, much, as many um, postings on that. Still, it just speaks to the difficulty of dealing with uh, Twitter. This is just automatically ex uh, extracted ones, okay? Just to give you an idea. These were not manually annotated. These were examples of annotated, um, automatically extracted. I was, when I saw this first, I was surprised. It's like, how in the world do we get a, such a smart extractor working? Um, so here it is. Didn't feel anything. Was tagged as an idea. Don't ask me why. Feature analysis will be really interesting to dwell on, but uh, but still, probably this problem was kind of tipped it off and said, okay, yeah, that's it. Uh, the press was marked as an indication, hard time staying awake, um, was also tagged as an ADR. Nightmare to come off, off, missing a word there. It's also a negative. So we are reaching the point where we link to literature. Um, there's no publication available yet. We have submitted the publication, so that's why I don't have as many details on this one as the others. I'm not sure it'll be accepted yet, uh, so we'll see. Uh, but basically what we did is we went to semantic, semantic relatedness techniques. Um, we compare our approach, which is a hybrid method, um, to L LSA, and it, we significantly outperformed that, okay? Um, just to give you an idea of where this is, uh, all of you familiar with the BioCreative contest and all that, which we participated in beautifully until BioCreative 4. Um, this is a good indicator that this is a hard task and it's a start. Okay, I remember the normalization um, task back in the day. Uh, and it was about that, if I don't remember if I remember correctly, actually it was less precise than this. Uh, so it was it ran about 50 and 60 for an F measure of 55%, something like that. Um, so there's hope <laughs> we're starting on this, okay? Uh, it is the first effort to solve the problem of normalizing, extracting ADR, uh, extracted advert drug reaction from tweets to UMLS concepts, which is a big leap, um, using natural language processing. Um, so I'm excited about that work. So as not to say that we're the only ones. Um, as I say, there is shared task data that you can use uh, for normalization. Also have that unified lexicon available. There are other resources. Uh, we just, uh, this one just came out 2015 and this one as well. A corpus of adverse drug event annotations from social media. Um, uh, so it is, uh, there's a publication associated with it, 
It's from a lab in Europe. Um, I hate when I don't remember the exact name of the people that are doing these things. So excuse me there, but... Which, which one? I think so. This one or this one? That one? Yeah, I think uh, if I could click, I would just click and get it. <laughs> <laughs> but in this case, uh, let's not guess. Um, so this one was interesting as well. ACL 2015, there was a workshop on no noisy user-generated text. This is not health-related, though, specifically. So, But still, it's useful. Uh, so no resource dedicated to health text normalization from social media other than our corpus there. So the challenges for linking to literature. So I, I drove you through the steps where we're finally ready. Once we have this normalization thing done, we should, in theory, um, get to the literature rather quickly, right? PubMed has mesh terms. Mesh terms can be mapped to UMLS concepts. What's the problem there? Why do I say this? Yes, and the two incompleteness do not complete each other. It just makes it more fuzzy. Okay, so yes, um, the mappings between MESH and UMLS are not one to one, of course. Um, so, in between trying to do that, so we're coming from social media to UMLS and then trying to get to MESH from there is not a one way street. So, we end up with too many ambiguous concepts, way more. And remember, we, we also unified some of the UMLS concept, which further amplifies the problem. So to us, the ideal situation could be if PubMed were to just be annotated with UMLS concepts and skip over mesh. OK? Um, that's a simple idea. Simpler say than that. But basically, what we do is exactly that. We grab MetaMap, run it on the abstract, get the concepts, the, the UMLS concepts, and then we have it. But it means we have to run MetaMap on every single abstract if we want to find all the things. Additionally, this morning, somebody mentioned one of the other problems we have. I don't know if you remember. Yes? No? No what? Most of the information not being on the abstract. True. That's a big one. I, that's not the one I had in mind, but yes, that is totally true. There's many papers that are relevant, so we should go to full papers on this one. Adverse reactions are not always mentioned in the abstract. Drug names is the next problem, okay? We get just the, the drug name from it, not the exact name. We tried Rx norm, which I failed to mention this morning. Rx norm is very, very fine grain. That's the one that has acetaminophen 500 milligrams, one ID. Acetaminophen, 600 milligrams, arthritis, another ID. And so it goes. Just uh, M -M Robitussin, SM, whatever, all the other endings for that particular one. So, so, so there, those are the problems. Those are the main challenges to link it, for linking to literature. But ideally, we should be able, or we want to be able to support some of these side effects that are mentioned by the people and get some evidence on whether it had been reported before or not, so we can focus on the novel ones, for example. Or if there's something in the um, mechanism of action of the drug that could indicate that this side effect that people are noticing is indeed possible. Okay? So ways of validating this uh, will be the next challenge, and that's exactly where the, um, uh, the, the, the well, once we solve normalization, which we have, it, this is the next thing. Try to validate and get the jump to literature. And I failed at four of six, okay. <laughs> so.